is able to save our very souls. Gracious God, now, Father, in the name of the great shepherd of the sheep, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's in his name that we pray and we humbly bow ourselves before you. We acknowledge his greatness, his mercy, his love, his grace toward us, and we stand because of the meritorious work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for the amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Thank you, Father, for the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross of Calvary, that blood that will never lose its power, the blood that you have accepted as complete and full payment for our sins. We thank you, Lord, and we bless your name. Now, Father, we humbly bow before you, acknowledging that we are as empty pitchers before a full fountain. And we pray that you might fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your love and your mercy. Fill us with your grace. Meet the needs that we have, Father, mentally, socially, psychologically, spiritually, physically, Father. Meet our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Speak a word of encouragement to that man or woman who is tired and weary, whose soul is broken, whose spirit is downcast. Let them know that there's a reason to look to the hills which come their help, for the help come from the Lord of glory, the one who does not slumber nor sleep. Speak, Father, to that young person, Lord, who needs an extra measure of your grace to resist the toll and the allurement of peer pressure. Let them know, Father God, that you know their struggle and you're able, Father, to help them to stand strong in the midst of opposition. Speak to that one, Father, who is struggling with spiritual decision as to whether or not to yield their lives to Christ. Let them know they'll never find peace for their tired, weary soul do they bow to the Lord Jesus Christ. Speak to that backslidden one that needs to be reclaimed, that needs to return to Bethel, to the house of God. Let them know there's bread there, there's refreshment there for their tired, weary soul. Speak to us all, and that we will know that we've been in the presence of God. And it's been more than the mere words of man, but the word of God has been spoken to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you have your Bible handies, please remain standing and turn with me to the 35th chapter of the book of Genesis. Let's look at Genesis 35, 35, Genesis 35, and I would like to pick up the reading with verse 1, and I'm reading this morning from the King James Version of the Holy Book. Genesis 35, look with me, if you would please, at verse 1. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau, thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make thee there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the day which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in the land, and all the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, where it is in the land of Cana, that is, Bethel, and all the people that were with him. And he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel, because their God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. But Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried beneath Bethel under an oak, and the name it, it was called al Bacchus. And God appeared unto Jacob again when he came out of Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. 
And God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply, nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed after thee I will I give the land. And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him, and Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil thereon. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him, Bethel. May the Lord's first blessing be to his word, may it be sanctified in our hearts, you may be seated. I want to speak to you this morning from the subject of returning to Bethel. Returning to Bethel. There's a popular song out today with the hip hop generation. And it goes something like this Shake it fast. <laughs> Watch yourself. Shake it fast. Show me what you're working with. <laughs> I don't think that the author of those lyrics really knew when they were penned that there really is a good word of warning to young women in those lyrics. And I don't have much appreciation for the rest of the song. I've listened to the lyrics very closely. I've watched the MTV video. I'm not impressed. But the first words that lyrics has a warning for young women. It says, shake it fast. Watch yourself. Amen. That's a good warning. For if you shake it fast, you better watch yourself. Because you might get yourself in trouble. And you might find yourself in a compromising position. Now I think that's the intent of that song, to get young women to shake it fast. And if you listen to the lyrics and watch the video, it speaks for itself. That's a good word of warning. You better watch yourself. In Genesis chapter 34, we're introduced to a young lady by the name of Dinah. Her father is Jacob, the man of the text in Genesis 35. And we've met Jacob before. Jacob, the younger of two twin sons born to Isaac and Rebekah. Jacob, the heel snatcher. Jacob, the supplanter. Jacob, the crook. Jacob, the con artist, who had to flee from his older brother Esau because he had tricked Esau out of his birthright. And then Jacob went to, to Padan Aram, and there he sojourned with his uncle Laban. And Laban was a bigger crook than Jacob. And so Laban deceived Jacob. Jacob think he was working for Rachel to be his wife. And Laban pulled those switcheroo on him and gave him Leah. And he worked seven more years before he was able to take Rachel to be his wife. And now Jacob has had to leave his uncle Laban in trying to return back to his homeland. So Jacob flees from Laban. He has to encounter his brother Esau, and to his surprise, God has melted down Esau's heart. And Esau has forgiven Jacob all of his trickery. And Jacob wrestles with God all night long, and God blesses him. So Jacob thinks that he's gotten over. He's made it back home. He's been able to escape from Laban. He's been able to be reconciled to Esau. He's met God, and God has promised to bless him. It appears that all is well. But the price of spiritual freedom is eternal vigilance. And just when we think we have arrived, just when we think that we have gotten over, then we are prime targets to be attacked by the enemy. And that's what happened to Jacob. He makes it almost all the way back home to his father, and he sort of lets down his spiritual God just a bit, thinking that he has arrived. And so if you pick up the narrative in Genesis 34, it says that Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Now the scripture is a bit vague in what it means when it says that Dinah went out to see the daughters of the land. The historian Josephus would suggest to us that the people in the land at this time were pagan and they were idolatrous people. And they had festivals where there was sexual morality that took place, and there was loose living. So Josephus suggests that maybe Dinah was going out to participate in some of the festivals that the pagan people of Shechem were having. And the Shechemites, they really like to shake it fast. 
So now, Diana puts herself in a, a compromising position. Now, she is a, a good girl from a good family. She has been sheltered. Her father has watched over her very carefully when they were in Padan Aram. She had 11 brothers, and they took real good care of her. And so she has been protected from some of the vices of life. And she's not acquainted with the fast lane. But the Bible says that she goes out to visit with the daughters of the land. And in verse 2 it says, When Shechem the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and he lay with her and he violated her. And so we see here there is a crisis now that occurs in Jacob's family. The crisis has to do with the defilement, the King James says, the violation, New King James says, of Jacob's daughter, Dinah. She has been sexually assaulted by Shechem, this Hammerite. Now, Dinah was just naive. And most women who are sexually assaulted, and most sexual assaults occur as a part of date rape. Can I make it plain? A carelessness. And Dinah was not to be blamed. Don't get me wrong. She's not to be blamed. She is the victim of this crime. She is the victim of this assault. But young women and even young men in this day and time, you got to watch yourself. Amen. One careless decision can result in your defilement and you being assaulted. This is a mean and cruel world out there. There are predators on every corner, Amen. lurking behind every tree. And you have to be careful. Dinah's carelessness led to her defilement, to her being assaulted. So now we have this crisis in Jacob's family. Now he's made it all the way back home. He's had to fight against Laban all these years. He's been able to, to make it all the way back home. And just when he thinks he can relax, a crisis occurs. And that's what some of you are. You think you get to where you can let down your guard, that you can relax. But my Bible says in 1 Peter 5, be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may defile. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so we have to be on guard. We have to be vigilant. We have to be sober-minded in our thinking. And I can think of no greater, greater advice to give the young people than to be sober-minded. We're living in a day and age where people are duping themselves with drugs and alcohol and trying to anesthetize themselves from the realities that life is just difficult and hard and there's no easy place down here. And what we find out is there's gross sexual immorality within the culture. And very often you find alcohol and drugs as a part of the problem. And we stand in this state on the brink, on the brink in this state of a serious, my beloved, serious. You look at the statistics and what you will see that we stand on the brink of having a serious sexual crisis in our state. Sexual transmitted diseases are on the increase. On the increase. The HIV virus is on the increase in this state. If there ever was a time for young people to be sober in their thinking and with premeditation make a decision to maintain their sexual purity and to abstain from sexual activity before until marriage, the time is now. And that's good advice for some of you older folk also. So now we got a crisis in this family because of the defilement of this daughter. This is, this is Jacob's only daughter. Now at this time he already has 11 sons, but he only has one daughter. So the assailant now decides that he wants to marry Diana. So he goes to his father, Hamor, and he says to his father, go and talk to Dinah's father and see if he will give her to me to be my wife. So Hamor goes to Jacob and he offers him a deal. And he says that we're willing to pay you a dowry. We're willing to make arrangements to where your sons can marry my daughters. And if you have other daughters, 
then my sons can marry your daughters. This can be of economic benefit to the both of us. Hamor looked at Jacob's livestock and his flock, and he could see he was a wealthy man, so he wants to make this marriage arrangement, this marriage covenant there in the text. Now, Jacob is a bit perplexed. He really doesn't want to know what to do here. He wants to avenge his daughter, but the problem is he's afraid that if he does that, then the allies of Hamor and Shechem will attack him because he has no allies in this part of the country. On the other hand, his sons are outraged. They are furious over what has happened. Pick up the narrative there in verse 4. So Shechem spake to his father Hamor, saying, Go, Get me this young woman as my wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled down his daughter. Now his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. And then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him, and the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved and very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be done. They were outraged. They were furious. This was their only sister. And I have to commend these young men for coming to the defense of their sister. I have to commend these young men for wanting to honor their sister. And her, their sister having been defiled and disgraced was something that caused them to be angry. And there's some things you ought to be angry about. In this day and time when people are basically selling off their children. And where there's very little loyalty among siblings. These young men were loyal to their sister. They were angry. They were outraged. In particular... His, two of his older sons, Simeon and Levi. Simeon and Levi were full-blooded brothers and sisters with Dinah. They had the same father, Jacob, and they also had the same mother. And so Simeon and Levi, they are, they are furious over what's happened, and they're not satisfied with how their father is handling it. So Jacob comes and he discusses with them the deal that has been proposed to him. They then offer a counter deal. They said, well, here's what we're willing to do. We're willing to give Dinah to Shechem as his wife if they're willing to be circumcised and come, become as we are. And here comes the deception. These sons were deceptive. And they were wanting to deceive Shechem and his father to buy into this counter offer by offering the right of circumcision. Hamor can only see the dollar signs. He's willing to do anything. Shechem can only see Dinah. He's willing to do anything. So they agree. They agree to submit themselves to the operation of circumcision. Hamor and Shechem and all the men that are in their village. Now pick up the narrative in verse 7. Or verse 8. But Hamor spoke to them saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife. Verse 13, but the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor's father and spoke deceitfully because he defiled down on their sister. And they said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for well, that will be a reproach to us. Now look at verse 19. So the young man, Shechem, did not delay to do the thing because he was delighted in Jacob's daughter. He was more honorable than all the house of his father. And Hamor and Shechem and his son came to the gate of their city and spoke with the men of their city, saying, These men are at peace with us. Therefore, let them dwell in the land and trade in it. For indeed, the land is large enough for them. Let us make their daughters to us as wives, and let us give them our daughters. Only on this one condition will the men consent to dwell with us, to be one people. If every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised. Would not their livestock, their property, their Every animal of theirs be ours, only let us consent, and they will dwell with us. And so the men agreed. Verse 25. Now it came to pass on the third day when they were in pain, the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came boldly from the city and killed all the males. Simeon and Levi had plotted this assassination of all the males that were in the village of Shechem. 
And so they offered the counter offer, which was a deceptive thing, and then they came in and destroyed all the men. The brothers came in and took all of their livestock and all of their wealth and their women and children. But look at verse 30. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed in my household and I. But they said, should he treat our sister like a harlot? So Jacob has a serious crisis on his hand. His daughter has been defiled. His sons have deceived uh, the, the men of Shechem. They've destroyed their entire village. There's no court now. There's no state police to come in and arrest anyone. People settle their differences basically by sheer force. And now Jacob is afraid that the other inhabitants of the land are now going to come and to attack him and destroy him. He has a serious crisis on his hand. Just when he thought that everything was going to be well, just when he thought that he could relax because he'd made it back home. But when there is a crisis, there's also words from God. So in Genesis 35, we see that there's a word from God. There is a command from God. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. So the command that God gives to Jacob is that he is to return to Bethel. You remember when Jacob was fleeing from Esau, that he slept under the stars one night, in a place called Luz, and in a vision, he saw a staircase from earth to heaven, angels coming down and going up. God stood at the top of the staircase, and he called the place Bethel, the house of God. He said, because surely God was in this place, and I didn't know it. And so now God calls Jacob to return back to Bethel, to return to that place where Jacob had vowed a vow that he would serve God. If you recall, when Jacob had met God at Bethel, he promised that if God would protect him, if God would allow him to return home in peace, that he would serve God, that God would become his God, and that he would be willing to even give a tenth of all of his earnings and all of his livestock to God. He'd made a vow. But Jacob had never fulfilled the vow that he had made to God. The promise he had made to God, he had never fulfilled that promise. God had fulfilled the promise to keep him, to protect him, to lead God, and direct him to bring him home safely, to prosper him, and to multiply him. But Jacob hadn't fulfilled his vow. And there are times that God, in his marvelous sovereignty, will allow the crises of life, the pressures of life, and the problems of life to press in upon us to remind us that one day we made a vow to him. Have we honored that vow? How we kept that vow? God can speak through the whirlwind. God can speak through the storm. God does not cause everything to happen. He's not some cosmic killjoy, but God can work through any situation or circumstance, even the defilement of Jacob's daughter, even the murder that the sons committed against the enemies. God could even speak through those things to get Jacob's attention to say, Jacob, I'm trying to deal with you. And so he calls him through a commandment, through divine revelation, he says, you need to return to Bethel. You're going to see there was a problem. Look at verse 2 of 35. And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Jacob, what in the world are people in your family doing with idol gods? He tolerated idolatry in his own house. He had allowed the enemy to gain a foothold in his own house. The reason hell had broke loose with his children is because the devil was living in his house. And so to get Jacob's attention, God allows this crisis to occur and said, you got some house cleaning to do, sir. And so Jacob calls the, the members of his household and says, it's time to clean up. It's time to straighten up. It's time for us to stop playing with God. 
And if we're going to serve God, it's time for us to serve him. And if God is God, then we ought to serve him. If Baal is God, then we ought to serve him. But we must choose this day whom we will serve. And so Jacob makes it a hard choice. You see, you, got to, you must prepare yourself to return to Bethlehem. You know the reason some people stay away from the church? Because they don't want to deal with the sin in their life. Sin will do one or two things. Sin will keep you from the church or the church will keep you from sin. Because when you come to the church to worship God, you must and I must, we all must deal with the sin that's in our lives. And we've got to ask ourselves seriously, openly, and honestly, am I sincerely trying to please God? And none of us are perfect, and none of us will arrive at sin perfection, but what God expects from us is to be confessing our sin to him and to turn it away from it, and that's why church attendance is therapeutic, because it forces us on a consistent basis to examine ourselves as to whether or not we're really serious about our commitment to God. And so he says, put away your foreign gods, your idol gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. That was symbolic, the changing of clothes, the taking off of the old and the putting on of the new, a sense of purging and purifying themselves so they could go and present themselves to God in an acceptable way. Verse 3, then let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands, all the earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the, the Tenebrineth tree, which was by Shechem. Now I'm not suggesting that it's idolatry to wear jewelry, all right? But in their case, their jewelry had became a part of the idolatrous practices that they had. They were worshiping the gods of images, and so they were making a clean break with any, any traces of the idolatrous religion which they had practiced back in this place of Padan Aram. And so they prepared themselves to go to Bethel. Now look at verse 5. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. Now that's not, that's not just put there. That's, for, that's there for impact. The one thing that Jacob feared, he feared that the peoples around him, once they heard of what his sons had done to the people at Shechem, that they would attack him. But when Jacob decided that he and his household was going to serve God, then God caused fear and terror to come to the people around them, and no one would touch him. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying when a man or woman's ways please God, God will make even your enemies to be at peace with you. When a man or woman's way pleases God and we're walking with God and the anointing of God is on our lives and folk won't mess with you. They'll leave you alone. They wouldn't say anything to them. They did not try to attack them in any way. Why? Because God had put fear and terror in their hearts that Jacob and his children were his people. So when we do what God wants to do, God will help us. Now, life is never going to be easy. The only question is, are you going to try to crank it out by yourself, or are we going to have God's help? Life is difficult for everybody. This is a difficult way. This is a hard press down here. The curse of sin affects the whole earth, the whole universe. And so things are difficult down here. Making a living is difficult down here. Even for folk who are out there on the street selling drugs, that's not easy either. Dodging bullets. Two folk been shot over the west side this past week. That's not an easy life either. Going to work from 8 to 4, 9 to 5 is not easy. Having a meaningful relationship in marriage is not easy. Raising children is not easy. Life is not for sisters. This is a difficult way. It's a hard press down here. That's why we need the grace of God and the hand of God and the help of God. So the only question will be, will God be on our side or not? So Jacob realizes that he really needs God on his side. And it took this serious crisis in his family to get him to realize that he wasn't as serious about his commitment to God and his service to God as he thought he was. So he makes his pilgrimage back to Bethel. 
So he, he comes to Luz, or, or Bethel, which he had renamed the place. And he built an altar there, verse 7, and called the place El Bethel. And that literally translates God of the house of God. Bethel, the house of God. El, God. God of the house of God. Because God was there and appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. But look at what happens, though. Even when you make it back to Bethel, it doesn't automatically mean that everything is going to be peachy cream. Verse 8, Now Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the terminal tree, so the name of it was called Alalon Bacchus. Deborah had been very dear to Jacob. Deborah had been his mother's nurse. And so now, even after making it back to the place of God, to the house of God, he still has to deal with grief and death. There's no easy places down here. Even when we're trying to serve God, there's going to be crisis in our life, problems in our life. Loved ones are going to get sick and loved ones are going to die. And that's why, that's why it troubles me when I see some of the TV evangelists, not all of them, but some of them, strutting around, talking about their people aren't going to get sick, and they're going to rebuke this, and they're going to rebuke that. If you live long enough down here, you're going to develop some disease. You're going to develop some illness and some sickness, and people can, they can drown you in oil if they want to. You're still going to get sick if you live long enough. Because these bodies that we currently have, they're not built for eternity. They're built for time. And sown into every body are the seeds of his destruction. Now, should we exercise? Absolutely. Should we eat properly? Absolutely. Should we visit our doctors? Absolutely. Should we pray for people to be healthy? Absolutely. Does that guarantee us that people are going to get sick? Absolutely not. People are going to get sick and people are going to die and we're going to have to mourn and we're going to have to grieve. That's just the way it is down here. So the crisis leads to a commandment from God, which results in communion with God. Look at verse 9. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name should not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. You see, this was all about change in Jacob. It was the work that God was doing in his life. So the situations and the circumstances are the things that God is bringing to bear in his life to change him into the man of God that God wanted him to be. His name, Jacob, hill snatcher, supplanter. God had changed his name to Israel, which means prince of God. And God wanted him to go from being a hill snatcher, a supplanter, and a crook to becoming a prince. And the process was the crucible of suffering. It was hardship and difficulty as God refines him. And so God communes with him. In verse 11, and God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. Nation and a company shall proceed from you and you shall have kings come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I give to you and to your descendants after you. I give this land. And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. So Jacob sat up a pillar in the place where he had talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him, Bethel. What are you saying, preacher? Well, what, I'm, what I'm saying is this, is that the crisis of life would drive us to having ears that can hear the command of God which will result in us having communion with God, and that which will sustain us over the difficult places is the communion that we have had with God to know that God has spoken to us, to know that we are not alone, that we do not face the trials and tests of life by ourselves, but to know that God is true to his promise when he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It is the communion with God that allows us to not collapse and to give in and to faint under the pressures of daily life and the intensified pressures of crises. Are you following me? You say, well, well preacher, where did you get that from? Well, look what, look what happens right after the communion with God. And I call this the contradiction. 
right after the communion with God, if you pick up the narrative in verses 16 through 22, Rachel, Jacob's wife, Jacob had a lot of wives, but the one he really loved was Rachel. And she was pregnant. And she was having hard labor, difficult labor. And her hard and difficult labor about the time that the child was born, Rachel died in childbirth. And she birthed to Jacob, his 12th son. And he called his name Benjamin, verse 18. This is after Bethel. This is after communion with God. He ha now has to grieve the loss of his wife that he loved dearly. The wife that he was bonded and knitted to. This is after Bethel. This is the contradiction of Bethel. The contradiction after Bethel is that things don't always go as planned. That we do not choreograph our lives and that all the time we don't live happily ever after. Sometimes we struggle every step of the way. And sometimes there's crisis after crisis, disappointment after disappointment, but the communion that we've had with God, to know that God has spoken to us, sustains us during the crisis of life to know that this thing is moving towards some type of ending. And that God is not merely playing tricks upon us, but that God is changing us and he's conforming us in his own image. And one day we're going to see him face to face. But it's not over yet. <laughs> not only does he lose his wife, Rachel, after Bethel, but if you go just a little bit farther, look at verse 27. Then Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, at Kerjath Arbor, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. Back up to verse 22 first. And it happened when Israel dwelt in the land that Reuben went out and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel, or Jacob, heard about it. This is enough to cause a man to have a nervous breakdown. His oldest sons have become murderers. His only daughter has been sexually assaulted and defiled. He's lost the wife that he loved. And now another one of his sons goes out and commit incest. This is after Bethel. This is after communion with God. But it doesn't, it doesn't end there. Verse 27, then Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, at Kerjath Arbor, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years, so Isaac breathed his last and died. And would gather to his people, being old and full of days, and his son Esau and Jacob buried him. He loses his father in rapid succession. So what do you do when the trials of life just won't stop? What do, you, what do you do when you can't seem to recover from one crisis after the next? Well, you remember Bethel. You remember Bethel. That you know that God called you by name. And you know that God saved your soul. And you know that God has promised you a good future. He promised Jacob that he would have many descendants, that kings would come out of his loins, that he would be a great nation, and that he would inherit the land. And so when you're going through difficulty and hardship, when you're grieving the loss of your mother or your father or a close loved one, when your children are rebelling against your authority and they're in the far country, you've got to remember Bethel. Bethel is the only thing that keeps Christians from losing their sanity. It is the experience of knowing that I know in whom I, may, I have believed and I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. You've got to remind yourself of Bethel. Yeah. 
that you know that God called you to Bethel, that God spoke to you at Bethel, that God promised that he's going to bless you at Bethel, that God promised to never leave you nor forsake you at Bethel. Now, some of you young folk, you think you don't need Bethel. You just keep on living. You see, when, you, when you're young, you're a risk taker by nature. That's just your nature. You think you can recover from everything. You got time on your side. You can make bad decisions and you can immediately recover from them. There are some decisions that you don't recover from easily and some bad decisions you don't come recover from at all. You better find your way to Bethel as a young person. You better find your way to Bethel and experience a personal relationship with God for yourself because there's going to be a time in your life when mama can't stand for you and daddy won't be able to pray for you and grandma won't be around and there'll be no friends to help you and the only thing that's going to sustain you is your own faith in God to know that you know him and that he's promised to keep you against that day. You need a Bethel experience for yourself. You need a Bethel experience for yourself. And there are some of us that we don't take the ministry of the church seriously. We don't think that it's important. We don't realize it's the ministry of the church that helps hold our lives together. And we don't realize how God uses the ministry of the church, the preached word, the taught word, the prayers of the saints, the encouragement, the affection, the care that we receive to keep us from becoming depressed and taking a 45 magnet and blowing our brains out. Are y'all going to help me this morning? Or do I have to preach for myself? None of, us, none of us are exempt. None of us are exempt from being attacked by the enemy. Don't you know that I have been so depressed at times in my life, so depressed I despair for my very life, didn't want to get up in the morning to face the world, but the only thing that pushed me out of the bed to know that one day, March the 5th, 1978, I met Jesus Christ for myself. And there are times when the pressures of life and the problems of life and the responsibilities of life seem to want to drown you, but the only thing that propels you to go on, that you know that you know it, that you started out a long time ago with a made-up mind. And you believe by faith that God has brought you too far to leave you. So when you look at all your circumstances and the situation, logically and deductively and deductively, you ought to quit. But the only reason you don't quit is because God always has the last word. If God has the last word. And the Bethel experience propels you along until you see the shining rays of the sun, even when the storm clouds are still hovering ahead. Oh, some of y'all need to go back to Bethel. You, you need to go back. You need to go back to Bethel, that place where you believe when the fire burned down in your heart. And when you, your heart burned when you heard the word of God. And when you couldn't wait to hear the word of God and read and study the word of God. And heaven was real. You need to go back to Bethel. And ask God to take the, the poker iron of the Holy Spirit. And to pry and to poke your cold, callous heart. And to rekindle that flame where it burned with a fervent heat to where you want to serve God. Like you know that God wants you to serve him. Someone says, I don't feel no way, sir. I come too far from where he bought me from. Nobody told me the road was going to be easy, but I don't believe he bought me this far to leave me. It's the Bethel experience. And we sometimes have a tendency to want to romanticize the Bible, and we want to look at the biblical characters as being as the sanctified folk who didn't have no problems. Jacob had enough dysfunction in his life for a hundred families. Everything crazy that you could imagine was going on in his family, but he still said, if God says, I'm his man, I'm still his man. If God says you're still his man or his woman, you're still his man or his woman, regardless what the circumstances might look like. You got to go back to Bethel every now and then. You got to go back to Bethel every now and then. You know, every, 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 every now and then. I have to get in my car and I tell my wife, I, I got to go see my dad. I just got to go see my dad. And I told her every time, every, every time I go to see him, he said, boy, I was just thinking about you. And I know he wasn't always thinking about me, but it makes me feel good. But he said, I was just thinking about you. It's something about going back home to hear him say those words. It's something about walking through the streets 
of my community when I was a boy and reminded of the love of the people of that little town and my family there. It reminds me when my spiritual juices first start to flow. It's therapeutic. And sometimes I can't go back, I just think about it. I just think about it. And then I think about being down in Mount Calvary, Michigan Baptist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee, March the 5th, 1978, and I can see Dr. Reverend Harold Middlebrook up there. Anybody want to know the Lord? Anybody want to know the Lord? And I remember when I came forward, yes, I want to know him. And when God saved my soul. And I know he changed me there. He changed me there. And no one can talk me out of it. Are you with me? Nobody can talk me out of it. And there's some things that you can't let nobody talk you out of. The fact that God has saved your soul. That God has done something in your life. He brought you through some things. You know it was the hand of God. And don't let nobody talk you out of it. And so when you find yourself in a crisis, when you find yourself in a storm, in the vice grips of life, remember Bethel. If he delivered me there, he can do it again. Isn't that what Jacob said? When I was running from Esau, he delivered me from Esau. If he did it then, he can do it again. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you for this grand time to come together with your people. We thank you, Lord, for the Bethel experiences that many people in this church have had when they came to know you for themselves. And there are some here, Lord, who've been to Bethel. And just like Jacob, a crisis drove them back. And they heard the command of your word. And they made it back to commune and fellowship with you. And now they're in that period of contradiction. But there's still trials and tests, hardship and difficulty. But I pray, Lord, that their Bethel experience will continue to propel them along until the change comes. Father, maybe there's one, two, three that never been to Bethel. They never come to that point in their lives when they realize they needed to change. Not because other people thought they should change. Because in their own heart, they realized that they were not the person they could be and that they wanted to be. And they realize it's because of their own sin, not because of something, not because of something someone else has done. Because they have failed to live perfectly before you. And maybe they realize they just want to be forgiven by the Lord of glory. They want to experience God's grace, God's mercy, God's forgiveness. I pray that you'd open their heart they might realize that you have made a way for them to be forgiven. You sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross of Calvary. And in his death, he was not dying for himself, he was dying for each and every one of us. The punishment that we deserve, you placed on him. The judgment that we deserve, you placed on him. The wrath that we deserve, you placed on him. You punished him in our place so that you could offer us forgiveness. He became our substitute. I pray, Lord, that you'd make it clear and plain to someone this morning. They can be saved. They can have their sins forgiven. They can know that they're right with God. They don't have to work for it. They don't have to earn it. They don't have to labor for it, but they do have to recognize they need it, and they have to receive it by receiving Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Speak today, Father. Take someone to Bethel that their soul might be saved. They might encounter you for themselves. And maybe return some Christian back to Bethel that they might be revived and encouraged to fight on until the change comes. In Jesus' name, amen. While well, the musician...